Ladies and gentlemen, today we're going to be looking at the link between alcohol and anxiety. We're going to be diving deep into the science. So we all have an intuitive understanding of anxiety. You're nervous and uncertain. You can't think straight. Your problems seem overbearing. Your heart is racing and maybe even pouring a cold sweat. Now, if we want to get formal, a commonly used scientific definition of anxiety is, quote, the apprehension of danger and dread accompanied by restlessness, tension, tachycardia, and dyspnea unattached to a clearly identified stimulus. However, when we talk about the link between alcohol and anxiety, we're talking about abnormal or pathological levels of anxiety. And pathological levels of anxiety come in a variety of so-called anxiety disorders. So first, let's have a look at three of the most common ones that are often linked to alcohol. Just before we get into the video, if you want to get access to the free video training showing you how to control your drinking without AA or willpower, click the link in the description. I'll be showing you how to use the mental model called first principles thinking to get control of your drinking. I'll be talking about the five critical mistakes that 90% of drinkers make. And I'll also be sharing the two phases of becoming sober clear. You do not want to miss that training video. It will change your mindset around drinking forever so you can start getting your health, career, confidence and relationships back on track. Click the link in the description for instant access. First is generalized anxiety disorder. So as the name suggests, this is when your background anxiety levels are chronically elevated. You're not anxious about any one thing or in any one particular situation as in other types of anxiety disorders. You're basically just worried about most things most of the time. The next is panic disorder. So the hallmark of this condition are very intense and unpredictable episodes of intense fear that last a few minutes at a time and then go away. And these episodes can be so severe that the person might feel like they are gonna die. They're also often accompanied by physical symptoms like heart palpitations, shortness of breath, dizziness, and chest pain. And finally, we've got social phobia. Here, the person has normal anxiety when they're on their own, but their anxiety levels skyrocket in social situations. Depending on the severity, they may get anxious only in specific social situations, like for example, when giving a speech. In the more severe cases, there is increased anxiety whenever there are other people around. So what's the link with alcohol? Well, alcohol and anxiety disorders tend to co-occur in the same person. Scientists call this comorbidity. And the comorbidity of alcohol abuse and anxiety disorder is much higher than we would expect if the phenomena were independent of each other. Now, we will get into the explanation of this comorbidity in a minute. But first, let's have a look at some of the data to give you an idea of just how connected these two problems are. Now, according to our best estimates from the larger surveys, people that are diagnosed with an anxiety disorder have a 50% higher risk of also being diagnosed with an alcohol use disorder. That's for anxiety disorders in general. But for panic disorder and social phobia in particular, these risks are even higher at more than three times and two times higher respectively. Those with generalized anxiety disorder are even more vulnerable, between three and four times so. Overall, scientists estimate that between 20 to 45% of patients with anxiety disorders have a history of alcohol problems. On the flip side, heavy drinkers are far more likely than the general population to be diagnosed with an anxiety disorder during their lifetime. In studies of problem drinkers receiving inpatient treatment, researchers find that between 23 to 70% of these people report a history of anxiety disorders. The massive difference between 23% and 70% is due to differences in various study populations, as well as differences in the definition of what counts as an anxiety disorder between the various studies. So how can we make sense of this relationship? Well, the question is, why is the comorbidity between drinking and anxiety so high? In principle, there are two possible explanations. A, one disorder leads to the other, or B, both disorders are linked to a third underlying factor. The scientific evidence at this point strongly suggests that it's the first scenario, namely one disorder leading to the other. Furthermore, the evidence suggests that most of the time it's anxiety leading to alcohol abuse and dependence rather than the other way around. One strong piece of evidence for this is that in most studied samples, the onset of the anxiety disorder precedes the onset of alcoholism by several years. When interviewed, most people in these studies also 
explicitly mention turning to alcohol as a coping mechanism. So, the reason people with anxiety disorders turn to alcohol is because it is a so-called anxiolytic. In other words, it temporarily lowers anxiety levels. Scientists don't understand exactly how alcohol does this, but they know that it involves a molecule in the brain called GABA. GABA is a neurotransmitter. In other words, certain populations of brain cells use GABA to send electrical signals and communicate with one another. And alcohol enhances the activities of these GABA neural circuits it causes them to fire more than normally. We know that these GABA neurons are involved in the regulation of anxiety because other substances that enhance their activity are also anxiolytic. Most notable amongst these are benzodiazepines like Xanax or Valium. These target the same GABA neural circuits as alcohol and are prescribed as a treatment for anxiety. Before benzodiazepines came along in the 1960s, doctors prescribed barbiturates for anxiety. These also targeted the GABA circuits. So what about alcohol as a trigger for anxiety? So whilst alcohol enhances the activity of GABA in our brain, this only lasts for as long as there is alcohol in the blood. As soon as we clear it out of our system, the brain restores its regular GABA activity and the anxiety resumes. But this can only happen for so long. You see, our brain is a very flexible instrument. Eventually, after sustained heavy drinking, it learns to anticipate the excess GABA activation that alcohol brings about. In response, it lowers its background levels of GABA activity. This then balances the effect of the alcohol and somewhat restores the GABA equilibrium. But when some time goes by without a drink, the result is increased anxiety. And when you're already struggling with anxiety, the added anxiety from a modified GABA system is the last thing that you want on your plate. For many people who find themselves in this situation, the only obvious solution at that point is to well drink even more. And guess what happens next? Well, this causes a vicious cycle of self-medicating with alcohol at even higher doses just to keep the anxiety from getting worse. Unsurprisingly, what these people should be doing is the exact opposite. Namely, stopping drinking completely and giving their GABA system a chance to recover. Numerous studies with inpatient heavy drinkers who were successfully treated for their addiction find that on follow-up, many of their anxiety disorders and phobias have resolved. What about anxiety after withdrawal? Heavily addicted drinkers must go through the tunnel before they see the light. And the most difficult part of the process is the first few days after their last drink. The GABA circuit at this point is operating at a far reduced output and left without alcohol, it's simply not up to the task. The outward symptoms of this inadequacy are increased anxiety and even insomnia. These symptoms are almost universal among alcoholic inpatients that have stopped drinking. In in fact, they can mimic the symptoms of panic disorder or generalized anxiety disorder. Depending on the severity and duration of drinking, this situation can last from a few days to a few weeks. The brain then goes on a gradual process of healing, and a couple of years after the last drink, it is almost indistinguishable from that of non-drinkers. 